Hello, Keith Kaiser here with another lesson from God's Word. We're doing Luke's Life of Christ, and currently we're in the Gospel according to Luke chapter 12. Luke 12, and we're going to start at verse 32. Luke 12 and 32. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And the Lord Jesus here is continuing this focus that looks away from the current time. It looks away from our present, the world as we currently know it. The world tells us, well, we got to work hard to get ahead. Look out for numero uno. Climb the corporate ladder. Look to your investments. Lay up for a rainy day. Prepare for any eventuality. Be ready for any calamity. And while there's something to be said for preparation and for being wise with our money and applying good sound fiscal principles, some of those are even found in the Bible, especially in the book of Proverbs. Overall, the outlook of the believer is to be toward the fact that this world is not all there is. This world isn't the end-all, be-all. It's not the summum bonum, the highest good. It is something that's temporary, something that's really a testing ground and preparatory for the real show, which is eternity. Eternity, of course, is forever and forever, the age of the age of the ages. And it has no end. And we are going to go on forever. But where depends on what we do with the Lord Jesus Christ. If we receive him as our Lord and Savior, crying out as repentant sinners, saying, I don't want to be a sinner. I want to be saved. I want to be a saint. I want to be a holy one set apart for the pleasure and the knowledge of the Lord. I want to know him and walk with him and live for him. The Lord who died for our sins and rose again to give eternal life promises to save us and make us his children, to reconcile us, to bring us into a right relationship with himself and to use us for his glory for it is god who worketh in you to will and to do of his good pleasure philippians 2 says now it's so beautiful then that as the lord tells them not to worry about seeking food and drink and material possessions as we've seen earlier in this passage when we come to verse 32 he says do not fear little flock the lord so often says to his people fear not you remember when he was walking on the sea and the disciples were in the boat and they didn't know who it was. They thought it was a spirit of some kind, an apparition. They knew they were scientifically minded people. They knew that human beings can't walk on water. But the Lord Jesus was doing something supernatural. The maker of the sea was reconstituting uh, the sea in such a way, arranging its atoms or however the Lord did it to be able to walk on that water. And he said to them, Be not afraid, it is I. Peace be still. And so often when the Lord appeared to them after his resurrection, he would say, Peace. <clears throat> and he would tell them, Fear not. And here again we get this exhortation from the Lord. He says, Do not fear, little flock. Now, little flock is not a put down. It's rather a diminutive of affection. <clears throat> it is the Lord who is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sake of the flock. who looks on us as his tender lambs, who looks on us in our vulnerability. And he knows we need protection. He knows we need defense. He knows we need provision. So we can say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, as the 23rd Psalm says. And he's that shepherd who calls us the little flock because he loves us. He's not only aware of our littleness in respect to his greatness. Compared to him, we are most little indeed. We do not come up to the grandeur of our God, or to the awesomeness of who the Son of God is. He is indeed superlative in every quality, whether we look at his moral glory as a perfect man, or whether we think about him as the Son of God, always doing the will of his Father, even unto the death of the cross, whether we think about his power and changing water into wine, raising the dead, healing the lepers, his works of compassion, helping the lame, cleansing uh, people that were defiled, opening blind eyes, and all these sorts of things. And yet he's a God who is tender towards us. He's the shepherd that comes near. He's the one who, as Isaiah 40 pictures the Lord coming and carrying the lambs in his bosom, carrying them next to his heart, carrying them in the place of protection and strength 
in their strong, omnipotent arms. He says, Do not fear, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This is how God is. As one hymn writer says, He giveth and giveth and giveth again. He's the giving God. That's what grace means. It's God giving us what we don't deserve. God's unmerited favor. And God is a God who loves to give. It is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Remember in Acts 20, when Paul was bidding adieu to the elders from Ephesus, he said, remember the words of our Lord Jesus, who said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Well, God exemplifies that principle and maxim himself. He takes great pleasure in giving and he wants to give the kingdom. He wants to share the very kingdom. Now, how many kings and despots and tyrants and even presidents and prime ministers in our world have tried to hold on to their fiefdom, hold on to their government, hold on to their administration, hold on to power at any cost? Lord Acton, a 19th century political philosopher, said it this way, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. We can see that in religious institutions as well as in political ones. And man's fallen tendency is to accrue power and hold on to it at all costs. But God is a God who has all power in heaven and earth and yet wants to share his kingdom. He wants to open up the good and the glory of it. He's one who delights to let his people revel in the spoils of that glorious reign. And so he wants them to treat what they have now in respect to the riches that they're going to have then. To exchange the earthly riches we may have, whatever quantity of them we have, we may not be rich, but we possess some of material things. And he wants us to use those things for his glory. He says, sell what you have and give alms. Now we see that the early church did this, that they came and people who had pieces of land like Barnabas would sell their land you know, he had a piece of land and sold it and brought the proceeds to the apostles and they distributed to those who had need. Uh, uh, Galatians 6 reminds us that we are to do good to all men, but especially to the household of faith. And the Christians were noted for taking care of widows and orphans and strangers and ministering to the poor. In fact, that's an Old Testament ethic that was written into the Israelite law, that the widows, orphans, and strangers were to be protected and cared for. That's why Leviticus 19 and Leviticus 23 talk about leaving the corners of the fields ungleaned to leave it for the widow, the stranger, and the orphan. And why Proverbs warns us more than once not to go into the field of the fatherless because the Lord is the avenger of all such, or not to move the ancient landmark. We're not to defraud others of their inheritance, and especially take advantage of the weak and the vulnerable. James 1, 27 says, But pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit, to visit the widows and the orphans in their extremity and to keep oneself unspotted from the flesh. So that altruism and love of neighbor, that philanthropy, true love of our fellow man, mixed with holiness of life, where we give like our Lord did, and we give alms, we take care of the poor and help those who are needy. He says, provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old. Now, an old wallet, if it has a hole in the bottom, your money can leak out. We remember God told Israel uh, when they were coming back from the captivity in the days of Haggai the prophet, he said, you have uh, put your money into a bag with holes. That's a bad thing. You can't hang on to your money that way. Your money's going to fall through the holes. You're going to lose it. It was a evocative metaphor of how they were working and working and working, and they weren't benefited. They weren't getting ahead. They didn't have anything to show for it because they weren't being rich toward God. They weren't giving to God, first of all. They had left off the building of his house, and they were really concentrating on decorating their houses, putting up fancy paneling and whatnot, and not really caring about God's things first. So God was taking away even what they were working to accrue. They had money that they're putting in a bag with holes. Well, here the Lord says, provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail. I think of how George Mueller, the great philanthropist of the 19th century, who was also a tremendous gospel preacher and Bible teacher and was very involved in the work of the Bethesda Chapel in southern England and later an itinerant 
minister of the word after he turned the orphanage work that he was famous for onto other people. And he said about that orphanage work, our money is deposited in a bank which cannot break. And it was a really powerful statement of his trust in God, knowing that God is recession proof, that he's depression proof, that God uh, can bring about money where there seems to be none and doesn't need any money really to do his work. He can do whatever he pleases. And so he speaks here about the treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. So whether it's humans that are seeking to defraud us of our money or creatures like the moth, natural things that could deplete our wealth, neither of these is able to take or destroy those true riches that are in heaven. And if that's where our riches are, if that's where we have our treasure stored, the Lord Jesus says, verse 34, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So this really has a present day effect. As we live in the present on this earth, we send ahead, as it were, our treasure. We say, I'm giving to the Lord's work. I'm giving for the help of the work in the local church. I'm giving to help send out missionaries. I'm giving to help support works uh, that are glorifying God around the world, whether they be helping the poor or reaching out to the orphans, homeless shelters, uh, places where people are counseled not to abort their babies and uh, adoption, Christian adoption agencies, things like this. So many different philanthropic works that believers are involved in for the Lord and also to give a platform for evangelism, to preach the gospel, to tell forth the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we give to these things, the treasure is sent on ahead, as it were. It's a deposit in the heavenly bank, and the Lord is keeping it safe there. If our treasure is the reward we're going to get with the Lord, what he's going to give us for our service and how we've used our things down here as stewards, Indeed, not only is our treasure unassailable, it can't be robbed from us, it can't be destroyed, we can't lose it, but also it's something that's going to motivate us to want to be in heaven more. That we're living so much for heaven now that when we get there, it's not going to be a shock to the system, as it were. We're going to say, this is what I've been living for all the while. It's like someone thinking about Uh, moving to another state eventually, and they've been saving and saving, and they've been paying money and sending to buy a property uh, somewhere nice in the sun, maybe down in Florida or somewhere. And they say, you know, I'm building this beautiful home to retire in by the beach, and I'm sending along the money to pay the contractors to build the home, and I'm investing in it. And I've gone online and I've picked out the furniture, and I've picked out the drapes, and I've picked out the artwork on the walls, and built the bookshelves and so forth to hold my library. And I'm just looking forward to being in that home. And every time it snows where I live, you think, oh, someday I'm going to be in that place where they don't have snow, someday where they don't have ice. Well, that's a small homespun illustration. And honestly, Florida is too hot for me. I'd live there for the work of the Lord, but I don't want to retire there, uh, at least not for many a year. Maybe if my metabolism goes very differently when I'm older, Uh, Maybe then I'll have a change of heart, but I like Pennsylvania where I live. But it's just by way of illustration that we can be living and preparing for another place where we're eventually going to live and how much we ought to be doing that toward heaven. If we know the Lord, it ought to be a great joy for us to live for him now in this world, to take the things he gives us, the money, the possessions, the homes, the cars, the time, the mental abilities, the spiritual gifts, Whatever we have, we are to use for the glory of God. We're to live as if our treasure is in heaven. We're treasuring up that reward, that those crowns that are going to be given to us at the judgment seat of Christ. But invariably, the crowns like those in the book of Revelation that we will cast at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's to motivate us right now. That's what's to be our delight. Not to look around and say, oh, woe is me. Look at all the difficulties I have in the life now. Look at how little I possess in this life now. Look at how I need to rush ahead and seek to get more and more and more and keep up with the Joneses. No, I can say, my treasure's there. It's real. It's in heaven with the Lord Jesus. My life is hidden with Christ in God, Colossians 3 says. And one day I'm going to be there 
with the Lord forever. And I'm going to be able to enjoy all the heavenly things he has for me. And I want to enter in, I want to have what Peter calls an abundant entrance into the kingdom. That I want to bring a lot of glory to the Lord. I want to send ahead a lot of things that the Lord is going to use for his glory and that shall adorn him through the ages of ages to come. So indeed, let our heart be in heaven because that's what we're treasuring up. We're sending ahead things that will be heavenly rewards in heaven by our service and our faithfulness to the Lord now. And may we indeed be people watching and waiting and longing with anticipation for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ to call us to himself in the air. Thank you for listening.